everybody. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com and welcome back to episode 158 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Uh, welcome back and hello. Uh, the questions are very simple. In a couple of the questions today, the person answers their own question, which really simplifies my life. So uh, this is episode 158. To be part of this great voyage, uh, just po- uh, email me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. We'll do our best to answer each and every question. Uh, as always, it's an honor to be here. And thanks for trusting me. Um, let's get started, shall we? All right. So Jake, Jake from State Farm asks us, in strength training in life, what is the value of wax on, wax off? Here is the scenario. Student approaches the master and wants to learn the secret of the way. I'm going to tell you Coach Mon's secret. First time I ever got a chance to sit down with him at, in his office, I said, Coach, you know, what's the secret of throwing far? And he said, lift weights three days a week, throw the discus four days a week for the next eight years. Everybody misses that last part, eight years. Everybody misses the fact that he was also talking to a state champion and an All-American and um, an MVP and conference champion. I'd won the, I'd won the conference uh, the conferences I were in four straight years, but he still expected me to put eight more years in after that, which, you know, brings you up to about 15, 16 years. That's a long time to become a master. Teacher provides some seemingly mundane, simple practice, says Jake, that student must embrace, sometimes begrudgingly, and repeat ad nauseum. After some time, a level of mastery occurs, and then the magic happens. It's true. Is this app is this applicable to easy strength or other programs and modalities you teach? I think the answer is yes. Thank you, Jake. The answer is yes. Okay, I'll give you more than that. Sometimes saying less is more. I'd like to hear you wax on this a bit. What, Jake? You know, that's kind of a clever, clever series of questions there. I enjoyed that. So yeah, I mean, the hardest thing about you know, elite performance is that it's mastering the basics. I mean, if if you're sitting next to the greatest jazz musician in the world on a plane and you say, what's the secret? They're going to tell you, you know, you got to know your notes. You know, you got to know where to put your finger. You got to know where to, you know, do that with your lips at this time versus that time. Yeah, it's it's always simple. Um, I'm sure if you talk to the greatest athletes in the world in any sport, I mean, I, I have great respect for Tom Brady, the uh, quarterback now at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And maybe his last season, I don't know, but I'm sure if you asked him his secret, he would say, you know, I spend a lot more time and there'll be some, it'll be some phrase that every high school coach in America will tell their starting quarterback. And we all know it, but it's the doing. And that's a life lesson. I mean, uh, I can hear my grandson's uh, Leo. He's upstairs. He's angry about uh, something. And, you know, when Leo comes around and asks me the secrets of life, uh, it's going to be s- simple stuff. Um, you know, uh, I wrote in 1996, you know, show up, don't quit, ask questions. I found out later on on the Internet someone uh, claims that I stole that from them. Um, in 1996, I don't think that person was on the Internet. I don't think they're old enough to. Uh, type yet. Uh, but it is, you know, the secret to success in my life is show up. Don't quit. And of course, the third thing is ask questions, you know, make sure you know what you're doing. You'll notice my conversation with Coach Mon started with me asking a question. Yeah, it could be that simple. It always, it's always that simple. Good question. Thank you. We have a question from Will. Well, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. All right. In recent years, sandbag throws have become common in strongman competitions. Okay. When I think about off-season training to get better at the bags, I have wondered about working in something like a hang power snatch. My thought is if I can throw 200 pounds over my head, a 40-pound bag should feel pretty light. Yeah, well, I hope if you're a strongman, you snatch more than 200, but... Oh, (laughs) sorry. 
I guess people get angry because I say sentences like that, but I really do mean it sometimes. Um, I know that throwers and Highland Games athletes use Olympic lifting. What do you think about strongman athletes using Olympic lifting? Well, you know, uh, I've written a lot about my interactions with strongman competitors. Um, it doesn't happen anymore. But from about 1999 to about 2006, six seven. Uh, when Strongman was going from being uh, just something you'd see on TV for one event a year to something a little bit more common, a lot of people asked my advice. Um, and really, a lot of the stuff, I mean, I mean, my biggest advice is, you know, do the Olympic lifts, clean and press, snatch, clean and jerk, do the power lifts, bench, squat, deadlift, and then, you know, figure out other things you might need like farmer walks and loaded carries. Uh, I'm a big fan of the yoke carry for sports other than strongman. I think, I think it's one of those, um, you know, when Artie wrote his book on strongman training, you know, I looked at that and I thought, you know, done correctly, this would be great for American football. But that was the problem. The people who read the book and applied it, and there's a school close to me that just about destroyed every athlete they had, they just ran with that and you know, just beat the athletes into the ground. And, I mean, if you're an American football player, it'd be great to have a big yoke carry and a big farmer walk and a big snatch and a big clean and jerk. But uh, if that's all you do, you're going to lose all those other qualities about, you know, change of direction, backpedaling. Uh, and, of course, by far, what I think the most important is thing, especially as a defensive player, recognizing what's about to happen long before it happens. Um not long ago, I, I was talking to somebody who saw me play a high school football game. And they said, it was weird to watch me play one time because when the ball was snapped, it seemed like I already knew what was going on. Well, it was because I listened to what the coaches were saying in the scouting reports, and then I just used my, my spider senses to figure. If a, guy, if a guy leaps out of the huddle and looks really excited, good chance he's getting the ball, and that's usually pretty true. Um, you know, uh, over at Dan John University, I have some basic Olympic lifting programs, um, some simple stuff. You know, Dave Turner has that great beginners program. It's probably too hard for you to be frank. I mean, I mean, I think it'd be a great off-season program. It's uh, clean and press, five sets of three, uh, snatch, uh, eight doubles, clean and jerk eight singles, and then he changed it. I had to do it the hard way, but to five sets of two in the front squat. But here's the deal. You have to do it all in one hour. Um, a couple things that might be good about this for you is that if you start to clean and press on day one, you go, so you go press, snatch, jerk, squat. Day two, you go uh, squat, jerk, squat, snatch, <laughs> sorry, Snatch, jerk, squat, press. Day three would be jerk, you know, so you just keep switching the order. I'm having a little problem here because my dog has uh, been running around. He's breathing like a psychopath next to me. So he's kind of throwing my thinking off. But that would be a good program. You do that three days a week. And here's the hardest part about it for you, Will, is that... Uh, you stick with a weight until you master all the reps. <clears throat> so, you know, something as light as 135 pounds in the snatch for eight sets of two isn't that hard. But if you're watching that clock tick by and you're trying to get those doubles in, uh, 135 can be exhausting. Well, when you finally master that, which, you know, I'm having many workouts, one workout, two, then you go up a little bit. Now you got 145, eight sets of two. Now, that's good for a short amount of time. I don't think an adult uh, will. I don't think that would be very good for you past. I, you know, if you did it, if you read, if you read the chapter I have on Dave in uh, uh, Forty Years with the Whistle, if you did some of the stuff he he recommends every day, you know where you're. He also did, we did the uh, all that stretching, the stick work, uh, those four lifts. Uh, we cleaned up, and the goal was to get it done in an hour, which was exhausting. Uh, you really can get ahead. Uh, you, you really get a great workout one hour. And I got to tell you, it'll feel strong, Manny. So check 
uh, Dan John University for some of that. Uh, check my book, 40 Years with the Whistle. But any Olympic lifting program is going to be helpful for you. And now, the other, now, finally, the last thing. I hope you're throwing med balls. I hope you're throwing sandbags uh, to, to really improve the throwing events. You got to throw. You got to throw. Throwers throw, jumpers jump, sprinters sprint. Okay? Don't let that fall out in your off-season program. You know, if you did Dave's program three days a week, which would be tough, and you said one day a week, I'm going to throw sandbags and medicine balls and just come up with a million variations. And on the other day of the week, uh, maybe practice one of your skills. You know, it's not going to be a full off-season training program, but, you know, pick one of the events and practice the event. And if you don't have all the equipment, fine. You know, make up something close enough and just practice, okay? Thank you. Uh, it was a good question. I appreciate it. Well, we have a question from Kyle. Now, this is interesting. My name is Kyle, and I'm a 29-year-old triathlete and rower from Montreal. Well, good. Uh, it should be in, Your question should be in French, but we'll allow this. I have been following along uh, in the background for several years now and have decided to put forth a double question about some off-season hypertrophy work. All right. My question is regarding the <laughs> the guns and buns routine, which we've now changed to ass, abs, and arms, <laughs> like that I, just as a joke. What does it consist of? Is it doable with the uh, armor building complex on alternating days? Well, sure. Uh, basically, it's you take uh, the hip thrust extremely seriously. You take the clamshell seriously, the goblet squat, overhead squat seriously. Uh, and deficit deadlift seriously, and you try to go back to back to back. My favorite one, we'll just give you an example, uh, this one I did the other day, so it's fresh in my head. Uh, I do bands on my hip thrust, so uh, double bands uh, to failure, which was about 25 reps. Drop a band off, you keep going. I don't know how many reps it was because I was on fire. Then finally, you drop that last, that second band off, so two bands, one band, no bands, and you just burn it out. Stand up, do a set of five to ten goblet squats. Walk over to some very lightweight, uh, you know, like a, I mean, a 36 kilo kettlebell, 40 maybe, and do like a set of really careful deficit deadlifts. And then do an ab wheel, just a set of five or so. Rest. See, so the set of five in the abs is going to be, uh, because to make your butt work harder, you need to really engage the ab wall. Uh, and it seems to help carry on the next one. And you repeat that just twice. So that be the, that's my favorite, uh, that's my favorite buns workout. And then for guns, we just do curls and tricep extensions or whatever variations you have. Uh, it's mostly, I went, it's not a joke. I, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When I do it, it is. Uh, but I never trained my arms uh, my entire career because, you know, I'm an Olympic lifter, thrower. And, you know, I notice some of these new guys, you know, they'll throw the discus and they'll go like this. And the funny thing is, they're not as good as we were. So maybe a little bit less bodybuilding and a little bit more actual throwing. But it's a good program. It, it's a, yeah, I would say there's some value to it. And it you're going to really be working those goblet squats a lot. But, yeah, you'll survive. Okay. Uh, my other question is about the DeLorme. Would the DeLorme program be all six squat, hinge, horizontal push and pull, vertical push and pull on the same day, three days a week? Yeah, I mean, you, you probably want to do add something like the hanging leg, uh, the hanging bent knee leg raise to that to get you up to seven exercises. Uh, I have to double check my math on that. <laughs> That's true. I did. It's like I looked down to make sure I was right. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you could, do that. yeah, uh, and there, I, I give you a number of options in my book, on, uh, books on how to do it. Uh, you can do the one set of 10 with 50%, uh, followed by one set of five or 10 with 70 or 75%. DeLorme kept changing those numbers. And the last set with what you're considering 100% is you go as many as you can. Brian Mann, I think he's down in Miami now. He came up with a, a plan, whereas if you do like, Five or six reps, you drop load next time because it's too heavy. If it's between like eight and 12 reps, you're fine. 
if you get like, I don't know, let's say 13 to 15, it's too light. You know, you add 10 pounds. Uh, if it's, I don't know, more than that, you add 20. And he had a little formula that worked out really quite nicely. Yeah, so um, if if you can do it, yeah. I mean, or you can do the three sets of eight like we do here. So, you know, front squat, three sets of eight. Uh, thick bar deadlift, three sets of eight. Uh, bench, three sets of eight. Row, three sets of eight. Uh, this is a lot of this is a lot of upper body work, but uh, military press three sets of eight, pull up three sets of eight, and then the hanging uh, bent knee leg raises. That'd be a pretty good program. How long can you do it? Uh, it you ask three days a week, but uh, I don't know many people who could do that far more than six weeks. Six weeks will be about the sweet spot. I'd rec more like I could see try three weeks and then take a deload. You know, maybe even take the week off and then give me three more weeks. So three off three, but I, it's, I don't personally, I've never found it to be sustainable, but it's a great program for a month to a month and a half. Always remember that some programs you can do for a year or two, some you can do a month or two, and you got to make sure you keep that balance in your brain. Uh, good question. Thank you. Uh, we got a question from Conley. Do you notice a link between a strong squat and running, jumping, hurdling performance? Before we even get to the rest of your question, it's one of those classic depends questions. I mean, if you got somebody who was born to hinge, which probably is going to be a better sprinter. To me, sprinting is a hinge. It's a pound. It's a, you beat the drum on the ground. If you, uh, <clears throat> most squatters, um, most squatters I've ever dealt with, dealt with, like these Olympic lifters I used to know as a kid, were really good, like at vertical jump. You know, we'd have these little vertical jump contests. They're really good at that. And in certain sprints, they were really good at it too. But um, they were really good, like out of the blocks. And then things kind of got a little wavy after that. So uh, I think it's a lot that depends on how you're born. If you're a born squatter, squatting will probably help your sprints. If you're a born hinger, hinging will probably help your sprints. If, you know, uh, I don't think you're going to find a lot of really, really, really short sprinters. I mean, you certainly will find some. But I've noticed, you know, through, through my career, is that sprinters tend to be about from this tall, to about that tall. They're in that kind of window of height. So you know, I, don't, if, I don't know if your English numbers are uh, American numbers or uh, meters, but somewhere between 5'7", five, 5'6", five, and about 6'2", generally are your, your faster sprinters. Usain Bolt, of course, was taller, and I'm sure someone has an example of someone who's shorter. Um, for six months, I stopped squatting and focused on deadlifts, presses, and pull-ups. And my road work my, oh, okay, this is, uh, see, so you say road work, mileage took a hit. When I added squats back to my training, performance seems to improve back to normal. I'm wondering if you had any training or coaching experience which suggests a reasonable squat is necessary to maintain the engine. Well, you, you know, I, the, the thing is, the second you said road work, and then I looked, I had to go back and look, and you said running, jumping, hurdling. Uh, unless you're running like the steeplechase, the, the need for road work is minimal. Uh, jumping, unless you're doing like a Spartan or one of those races where they have to hop, climb things, you know, the need for road work is minimal. Um, I think this is one of those questions, Connolly, where what you're saying, what I'm hearing might not be the same. But in your case, and this is important to keep in mind, in your case, it seems to help. So you almost, by definition, should keep that, okay? Uh, uh, what helped my sprint sp speed is getting my snatch and clean and jerk to freakish numbers. And it wasn't from the squatting. It was from the, it was from the big pulls. So there you go. Thank you. That was a good question. Uh, if you want to do a follow-up with just a little bit more clarity, I'd really appreciate it, okay? Thank you. We have a question from Jacob. Ah, Jacob. Jacob says this. I now I tried my first heavy hands walk one mile with toe shoes, Vibram five fingers, of course, 
five pound dumbbells and a 30 pound vest. And of course I would just go, that's your first time. Okay. A, the mile's probably too short. Uh, doing the, 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 the finger toe, toe shoes. That's fine. But having five pound dumbbells on the first time and a vest, I wouldn't mind. And this is happens all the time. Uh, you take this great idea and you go right to the hardest. Uh, I'd rather have seen you go like three miles with just the fives, but that's just me. I tried exaggerating arm swing, straight arms, 90 degrees at elbow, and bicep curls while taking big steps. Keep on trucking cartoon. I also did alternating seesaw overhead presses. That is the easiest way to get your heart rate, heart rate through the roof. That is a tough one. That seesaw press walk, uh, you have to do that weird lengthen. It almost looks like you're doing a lunge down the street. Oh, and your heart rate just freaks out. Yeah, very good. That last one was a killer. Escalated the heart rate and as much burn as you like. Um, when I was getting around 12 to 15 minutes of walk time, my shoulders were really starting to get tight. My question is, what do you think heavy hands does for shoulder health? I think burning out the shoulders a little bit in this manner might be good. I don't think that's bad. Post question, how to deal with giggling neighbors as I strut down the block, looking as one does, huffing and puffing and slinging his limbs about. Well, you got to move to my neighborhood. My my neighbors have no idea what to think about me, my friend. Um, they know that they're in a very safe place because of who I bring in and uh, who trains with me. It's pretty obvious sometimes that the groups I'm training with uh, – have uh, seen a lot of real combat, not the nonsense you know you hear on the internet. Uh, speaking of, I was just thinking the other day uh, it was the death of uh, it's the anniversary of the death of a whole bunch of my friends uh, who died in combat. Uh, terrible tragedy, and uh, they trained with me, and I and I think to myself, uh, uh, well, it's, it's something I don't want to talk. About. Um. What do heavy hands do for shoulder health? Okay, let me just, I'm going to flip one thing for, real quick for you. I don't know what they do for shoulder health, but here's what I have found. Is that as you walk, and, and I'm sure Stu McGill could clear this up better. I'm sure Myers could clear this up better. He's anatomy trained. Uh, I'm sure Greg Rose could do a better job than me because he's, you know, uh, he's TPI and uh, the golf guy he, he, with all the spinal stuff. But having those heavy hands here and then here, my back goes, woom, woom. It, it, it springs as I walk. And I got to tell you, I think that's the healthiest thing I do for my spine. Now, here's my point. I want to know about this, Jacob. When my spine feels good, my hips and shoulders feel much better. When my shoulders feel better, my elbows and wrists feel better. When my hips feel better, my knees and ankles feel better. So maybe the shoulder health that, and of course, the other thing too is, you know, you're just, you're gently moving it through a nice range of motion, through that elastic range of motion. So maybe it is good for your shoulder health. Now, the Kawhi study told us that hanging is a, a great thing to do with shoulders. But I have found, and I think kind of like you, Jacob, that doing the the springy heavy hands helps a lot. So Jacob asked about heavy hands, uh, which I love. The only thing I would uh, remind people is that you do look kind of like uh, there's something wrong with you, and just keep just keep going because I honestly I don't want to look like a normal American. Have you ever been to the mall or to an amusement park? You look around and. I'm not being that. I'm not being a jerk. I'm just saying, you know, you don't need to look like that. I mean, men wearing shirts that you, uh, you know, you might wear when you're 15 and, uh, you know, men wearing skinny pants with holes in them with beer bellies. I just, I just don't get it. Um, and, uh, but the other thing, is it good for, is heavy hands good for shoulder health? I'm going to say yes. Because I think it, because it makes the spine healthier and drags everything else with it. Good question. Thanks for asking. Harry asked a question. I was wondering your thoughts on not planning rest days from resistance training within a given training week and rather 
Simply lifting every day provided one feels well recovered and letting life provide the days off in the event of travel, some emergency, uh, emergency that gets in the way of lifting or other disruptions. Um, if you read my work, and it's in the book, Never Let Go, I have a whole section on one lift a day. Over there at Dan John University, uh, we also have a lot of other information. And I'm actually including uh, all that stuff in uh, my new book, the Easy Strength Omni book. Uh, some of the best training in my life was when I started lifting every day, but just doing one lift. Now, does life get in the way? The knock I have on this, because I've tried this, Harry, if you don't mind, is what happens is if you circle Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Saturday at 7 a.m., uh, 7 a.m., you and all your friends meet in a park and you have an intentional community workshop, you do strongman events, you play catch with kettlebells, you throw med balls around. Monday and Wednesday, you you Olympic lift it, you, you know, you do some front squats and you do some farmer walks. People start to get used to the rhythm of what you're trying to do. So people get used. So your family gets used to you being gone at those times. Uh, you start to mentally schedule things in. I found, and I've, I've done something similar to what you're doing because of life. It was in the nineties and I remember it well. I try to get what I could when I could, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Harry, this is also when I came up with Easy Strength uh, later. Uh, the, uh, I would say it would be the early editions. Um, if you look at my journals before I met Pavel, you'll see I was training Easy Strength sometimes because I had no other options. Um, and I was doing these hyper quick workouts with basic exercises. Uh, with I had almost no variations in load, so I had to do, I had to outthink the bar. Um, so I guess I, I, I hate to have an answer where I muddle like I am now, but I, I think what you're saying is a good idea, but keep trying to get yourself back on schedule as best you can. So make sure you're hearing both sides of this. I agree with what you said, but do your best to get yourself on a schedule. And the only reason I'm saying a schedule is that you you live in communities, your family, your business, your neighbors, your friends, and a, a rhythm begins to build up. And I think it's imperative, it's important uh, that people go, start to even think, well, you know, uh, Harry can't get drunk on Friday night because Harry has to work out on Saturday. And I think it's a real boon to you long term. I hope that helped. Thank you. So we had Harry, and now we have Larry. I'm 40 years old, started working out with a personal trainer about seven weeks ago. <laughs> so you ask me a question, you've got a personal trainer. I like that. My goal is to lose weight without cutting off one of my limbs. There you go. I have been training four days a week for the last seven uh, weeks. When I look back to week one, I am able to lift heavy weight, do more reps, of course, or both on everything in the program. While I know I am getting stronger, I have only lost about two pounds, and I don't see any noticeable difference in body comp when I look in the mirror. Well, yeah, I mean, because <laughs> fat loss happens in the kitchen. <laughs> um, okay, all I can tell you is my experience with something we call uh, easy strength for fat loss. Uh You know, the reason I like intermittent fasting is when I started doing intermittent fasting, uh, the numbers on the scale went down. The reason I like drinking a lot of coffee uh, and training in the morning uh, while fasted is what I notice is when I drank a lot of coffee, fasted and worked out, the body, my body weight on the scale went down. When I started eating a lot of kimchi and sauerkraut and fermented foods and focusing on fiber at every single meal, I noticed my body weight on the scale started coming down. When I started drinking hot water with uh, lemon, uh, I noticed that it, it was I it wasn't subtle. It was actually pretty good. Uh, I noticed that my skin, the body weight on the scale started coming down. Once I started walking, now this is the big one. Boom! 
Once I started walking after my weight workout with coffee in a fasted state, after lifting, I walked. That's when I had the game-changing performance. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is there's, there's two sides of what I'm trying to tell you. First, you're going to have to figure out some uh, nutritional intervention, some caloric restriction that works for you. Uh, if you decide to go zero carbs and you love it, do it. If you go zero fat or whatever, great. If you decide to just eat vegetables, great. Just eat you know, you know, white mule tail deer and that, whatever works. And that's what, you, and you can stick with it. You know, uh, Vince uh, Garanda's 36 eggs a day thing. Dave Draper's tuna and water. Oh, both of those, huh? But it worked for them. So you're going to have to find some kind of dietary intervention that works for you. For me, fasting, something I've never done in my life. It's interesting, I never really worked my arms and I never did fasting. Uh, and right now I do both and it's like, wow, where have you been all my life? Um, nutritional interventions, uh, things that work for you. So you might have to do a few experiments. You might want to say, okay, I'm going to do uh, the Atkins two-week induction. Remember, no one ever read the whole Atkins book. I think I'm the only person who read the whole book. He does have a tough two, uh, the two weeks is induction, but then it's, read the book, people. Quit comment. I hate it when people comment without actually reading. Show some integrity. <laughs> um, you know, find, find a way of eating that works for you. And it can be, I mean, if it's, if it's, I had someone tell me they lost weight by eating a bowl of a fiber cereal before every meal. I had someone else tell me they, they ate a can of corn before every meal, and it worked for them. Corn and I don't agree with each other. I, I can guarantee if you ate a, you know, if you ate a full serving of black beans before every meal, you probably wouldn't be chowing down a lot of bad food after that. I don't know if I want to be in an elevator with you, but, you know, you'd, you'd lose some weight. Um, and, of course, on the other side, uh, you know, you didn't talk about your sleep. You didn't talk about the training. But there are gaps in your question. Uh, you need a nutritional intervention. You probably need to look at the quality of your sleep. You probably need to have some extra walking in. And of course, the basics, you know, drink excessive amounts of water. Mm. And just do the basics. Um, if you can, get back to me with any progress. And I'd be interested to see what else you're doing. Thank you. We have a question from Sam. I train by myself at 5 a.m. in the morning in the garage. Obviously, that's my mistake. He didn't say 5 a.m. in the morning. I did. Sorry, 5 a.m. in the garage. Obviously, I'm always tired when I start, but I do it to maintain discipline and because it's the only time of day when I can just get a workout in. <laughs> I know that one. In your opinion, is it unsafe to train the Olympic lifts at this time? unsafe. Well, um, I remember when I was young, they used to warn us not to train in the mornings heavy because, uh, I wanted to say it was like synovial fluid or something like that is that your body needs some time to adjust, you know, to elongate again and all the rest. Um, in my own case, when I found out that I had to lift at a meet at 9 AM, not weigh in, but be on the platform at nine, I thought to myself, well, that's nice that that's what someone told me once, but I got to put weight overhead. Uh, for me, uh, a warm up, a general warm up, uh, and now it's more walking and mobility work than it was in the past. I just did. Oh, and actually practicing the lifts. That might be enough for you to do it. So, so there's two sides. The, the tradition is be careful, but in truth, we have more tools now that you can probably Olympic lift. But here's the thing, you know, um, uh, Sam, if it's, I mean, if it's just, if it's just busting you up, don't do it. Um, I could easily just, uh, he could just as easily use kettlebells for my hinge movements, but the Olympic lifts are too damn fun not to do so. Well, you know, I, I am a master of the garage gym training. I've been doing it my whole life. Uh, over there at the Dan John University, we have the workout generator. 
uh, it might be worth, this is just an idea. This is an untested idea. So this is the first time I ever said this, but why don't you find a system? I don't, you didn't say how many days a week you work out. Let's say five. Let's just say five. Try to find, when you go to the generator, plug in five and then plug in 30 minute workouts. At the end of those 30 minute workouts, now that you've done push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry, you've done mobility work, you've done a warm up, you've done this, you've done that, then Olympic lift. Uh, let's try that a few times and let's see how that goes. And if you can, get back to me, okay? Thank you. We got a question from Bart. I'm a 30 year old special operations guy. After first reading your work about eight years ago, I decided to learn the Olympic lifts and have incorporated them in my training since then. I've been getting a hankering to try easy strength for Olympic lifting, but I have some issues with the clean and jerk. Whenever I do full squat clean, split jerks, and power jerks, I start to develop uh, patella tendonitis. And that is a tough one. Uh, I can almost bet, Bart, bet, Bart, that you had patella tendonitis before you got the, to start doing the Olympic lifts. Uh, and, uh, you special forces guys with your rucking and, you know, going fast down, down hills, rucking, uh, some of the, some of the nonsense that you have to do, uh, that just beats the patella tendon up. And then of course we're not going to, um, I got patella tendonitis in 1976. And when I rub the patella now, I can still feel the calcium deposits in there. It doesn't go away. So, okay. Um, he says, I don't think this is a technical issue as I've had some pretty experienced weightlifters evaluate my form and they say it, it's fine. High praise for you, Bart. Hey, it's fine. That's yeah. So, uh, daddy, I met the man, the man of my dreams. What's he like? Oh, he's just fine. Uh, my knees already get beat up by all the running and rucking my job requires. And I think the squat cleaning jerks, uh, just put them over the edge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Would it be acceptable to replace the clean and jerk with a power clean and push press? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we had this conversation not, not that long ago. How, you know, Pizza Steve, the great shot putter friend of mine. Yeah, he threw really full. And uh, he, he said, yeah, all I did was snatch pulls and snatch cleans. I, I didn't want to bang up my wrists uh, flipping the bar over. And I went, that's such. And then I found midway through my career that the power snatch and the power clean seemed to help me uh, stay fresh and alive for throwing. The mistake I always have, and, and, I, and I war I'm kind of reaching out to you, Bart, because of your career, um, <sighs> yeah, I've been... <laughs> Okay, I've been working with special forces since 97 or 90. Um, you guys are wonderful. And I really like you. You've slept in my home. You're, a bunch of you came to my daughter's weddings, which mean the world to me. I've attended some memorial services for some of you. Um, you guys mean a lot to me. Uh, the problem uh, that some of you have is this on-off mentality, uh, black and white. This is good. This is bad. You suck. I'm great. And one of the things I just want to caution you a little bit, and this is kind of from the heart, is doing the power clean and push jerk is going to be great. Do that for a bit. Walk away from it. Try something else. Uh Try your best not to say this is good and this is bad as best you can. I always joke in my in my writing about this isn't moral theology; it's just lifting weights. Wow, I, I hope I hope that helped. I, I thought it was a good uh, question, and and I'm always honored to help. Well, listen, there you go. Uh, there's our podcast. I'm Dan John. This was podcast. Uh, who can forget? Uh, 158. And if you have questions. As always, you email them to us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. I thought our questions today were really good. 
And, uh, well, until next time, let's all just keep on lifting and learning. Thank you so much. Goodbye.